Saying that the lunatics have taken over the asylum used to be a joke. Now it's our day-to-day -day reality. The British regime, and I phrase it that way deliberately to take account of the fact the rot goes much deeper than just the government. Those empty sock puppets playing the parts of elected representatives took the decision last week to bomb Yemen. It goes without saying nowadays that we, the British people, were not consulted in advance, far less our blessing sought for the making of more war on more people we don't know. Without any recourse to Parliament, that hollow charade supposedly comprising those sent by us to do our bidding and so take care of our best interests, ha ha ha, what nonsense, but which in reality is a mob of self-serving frauds who, if integrity was dynamite, couldn't blow their own noses. Without consulting that confederacy of dunces, unelected Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and unelected Foreign Secretary David Cameron and the rest of the goons dispatched warplanes to Yemen in our name. According to our government's own website, quote, on 11th of January, Royal Air Force aircraft joined coalition forces in striking a number of facilities used by the Houthi rebel faction in Yemen to attack shipping in the Southern Red Sea, end quote. Thanks for telling us, lads. All-encompassing war in the Middle East, anyone? And so, in addition to helping underwrite the slaughter of generations of Ukrainian men and boys in the name of non-existent democracy and creeping NATO expansion and the carpet bombing of babies and the rest of the civilian population of Gaza, our taxes, the nation's wealth, as yet unearned and only added to the Himalayan mountain of debt, is being spent, you might say, securing the Red Sea. The Red Sea is more than 3,000 miles from London. RAF aircraft are dropping bombs on people there to help secure that waterway. And yet the British regime is incapable or rather prohibited from securing the English Channel that you can practically see from the roof of the Palace of Westminster. That's what we supposedly pay our taxes for, remember, at least in part, the security of our borders. I shouldn't need to say I'm not here calling for the bombing of the Channel, but in this time of lunacy, I will make clear I don't think it's too much to ask for a bit of effort to maintain a border. But while our unelected, self-promoted, self-described leaders rub their hands with glee at the prospect of further investing in the dividends payable by the military-industrial complex, the southern approaches to the United Kingdom are spread wide for the pleasure of all comers. Roll up, roll up, get your British taxpayer-funded free life here and help yourselves to whatever catches your eye while you're at it. Like us, the citizens of the US have no meaningful southern border. Millions of new people have arrived in recent years. New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who declared the Big Apple a sanctuary state for immigrants cheerfully enough, now says it will cost $12 billion to house and care for the tens of thousands flooding the streets for the next three years. He said this year New York must spend $5 billion on its immigrants, more than it spends on police, fire and sanitation combined. Those on the move are victims too. It's the decisions by our so-called leaders to repeatedly bomb the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and on and on and on that provokes the millions into moving elsewhere, including here. Is it a deliberate flooding of the West, a deliberate destabilizing of the West, or just the byproduct of greed and corruption? I said at the top, the lunatics have taken over, but at best, they're lunatics. Because if it's not madness that drives them to drive the rest of us off a cliff, then it must be pure and simple badness. Hardly a soul in authority is prepared to talk about the excess dying every moment of every day here and in countries all around the world. 100,000 extra dead in the United Kingdom since January 2022, 30,000 more than all the British civilians killed in six years of World War II, and yet the official silence on the matter blows like tumbleweed down the corridors of power. And while young people drop dead and otherwise healthy people of all ages are harvested in hitherto unheard of numbers by heart disease and turbo cancer, our old friend Pfizer has been spending some of its recently acquired massive wealth buying companies that develop drugs to treat heart disease and turbo cancer. I don't know about you, but until just a few months ago, I'd never heard of turbo cancer. For me, the C word alone had always been scary enough. Four cylinder, five gear kind of cancer, already capable of moving at lethal speed. 
all of a sudden now, though, we've got turbo cancer, fuel injected, maybe with a bottle of nitrous oxide on the side for that sudden terrifying burst of speed across the line to unexpected death. And dear old Albert Borla, multi-millionaire boss of big pharma giant Pfizer that made billions pushing something they called a vaccine, but that was actually a gene therapy, boasts now about his company spending $43 billion to snap up CGen, a small outfit specialising in treating turbo cancers, making Pfizer overnight the unchallenged global leader in cancer treatment. Borla has been all over the media predicting turbo cancers will affect a third of the world in the years ahead, even declaring that entire families will be affected. No one asks him why, obviously, just a new fact of life. He delights in informing us that Pfizer will be able to produce CGEN's drugs at unprecedented scale, much like it was able to do with those mRNA-based injectables during the so-called pandemic. Pfizer have also spent more billions snapping up Arena Pharmaceuticals, another small company that specialises in treatments for immuno-inflammatory diseases, including myocarditis the condition that has, oddly enough, in the past few years, stopped the hearts of an unprecedented number of otherwise fit and healthy youngsters, including elite sports people on the field of play. Quote, We're excited to add the impressive experience and pipeline of Arena Pharmaceuticals to Pfizer's inflammation and immunology therapeutic area, helping us further our purpose of developing breakthroughs to change the lives of those with immuno-inflammatory diseases said Mike Gladstone, global president and general manager of Pfizer Inflammation and Immunology. The southern borders of the UK and the United States lie undefended. Millions of citizens spend sleepless nights fearful about the future, about paying bills, heating their homes and feeding their children. And yet, in another stunt at our expense, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak skips out of beleaguered and broken Britain to hug fellow homunculus Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and hand him another £2.5 billion we haven't even had the chance to earn yet. Quote, Our support cannot and will not falter, he declares. Britain is with you for as long as it takes. Open brackets. Regardless of how many British lives must lie in tatters or cold in the ground on account of my unelected, unasked for and unwanted contribution to the state of the nation. Close brackets. If insanity is, as Albert Einstein said, endlessly repeating the same action in expectation of a different outcome, then the British electorate is collectively as mad as a cut snake for continually trusting more of the same politicians to care a jot whether we live or die, far less to act in anything approaching our best interests. The madness is all around the world. The scaffolding of nations is buckling under the weight of the lunacy and the wickedness of those in charge. In Germany, thousands upon thousands of farmers and other citizens have gathered to protest the spending of their taxes on endless wars, while those tasked with feeding the nation cannot afford to buy fuel for tractors. Instead of admitting mistakes, German politicians fall back on more name-calling, tossing around the far-right label in a doomed bid to silence the righteous. The truth is, our so-called leaders have no concern for the peoples of their countries. It's true in the United States, in Germany, all over Europe, and it's true here. In recent days, we've been invited to consider what happened to more than 900 British sub-postmasters wrongly and shamefully prosecuted for theft, jailed, humiliated and otherwise destroyed, when in fact it was technology trumpeted and installed by Tony Blair's government that made the mistakes and unleashed the mayhem. The truth has been available in every way that matters for years but it was denied, denied and denied again by all those responsible. A TV drama aired and all at once the guilty were falling over one another to shed crocodile tears. Sir Ed Davey, now leader of the Lib Dems, but then the government's postal minister under Prime Minister David Cameron, trousered the better part of a third of a million quid while also serving the law firm that so aggressively and effectively targeted those sub-postmasters. Even as the evil was at its height, he refused to meet, far less to listen to those suffering the wrong of it all. Also turning a blind eye was Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer, sometime boss of public prosecutions. Prime Minister Sunak 
has had the unmitigated gall to take it upon himself to describe the destruction of nearly a thousand lives as one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. Without doubt, those people are the victims of an obscene and unforgivable wrong. But to have to listen to more insincerity devoid of a grain of genuine empathy from the man presiding over so much else that's terribly amiss, the ongoing horror of excess dying of undiscussed, unexplained causes in the aftermath of the so-called pandemic, ruinous lockdowns, the handing over of our unearned billions to perpetuate the profitable slaughter in Ukraine, the slaughter in Gaza, to attack Yemen in our name without our consent, is nothing more than salt rubbed in open wounds. At Harvard University, the very summit of aspiration in the US, the self-righteous intelligentsia of diversity, equity and inclusivity are running for cover, exposed like bedbugs from under a flipped mattress by a bright light, alleging plagiarism, which is what educated people call cheating. If the ideologues of woke, those demanding enthusiasm for, among other pursuits, the surgical mutilation of children are stripped of their claims of expert status, on what other grounds could they possibly insist on lording it over us mere mortals, armed only with common sense and truth? And so here we are, in a lunatic asylum governed at best by lunatics, at worst by cheats, liars and sociopaths. Here's the thing. Next week, the usual suspects, the billionaires and the bosses of transnational corporations and their assorted hangers-on will gather again in Davos in the mountains of Switzerland, there to plot more of the fate they have in mind for the pesky human race. The published agenda this time is about rebuilding trust. Trust in those mad clowns. What they need up there in Davos with their heads in the clouds are well-tailored straitjackets and padded cells.